afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today on this Health for a Change webinar. Again, my name is Rochelle Seeger. I'm honored to work here at the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky. I'm the Community Health Research Officer. That means I work on the Foundation's data initiatives, including the Foundation's annual Kentucky Health Issues Poll and data website, KentuckyHealthFacts.org. I also get to work on this piece, which is very fun for me because oftentimes I get to meet people just like yourselves who are working in Kentucky to make improvements on health and all the things that we do to make that happen. This series is Health for a Change, and the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky began Health for a Change series of webinars and workshops in 2001 to support nonprofits, health departments, and other folks just like yourselves working to improve health across our commonwealth. The website there, healthy-ky.org, on the events tab, you'll see the Health for a Change lineup, upcoming events, also a recording of the webinars. So today's webinar is being recorded, and a day or so after this event, we'll also share with you the full slide deck so you have that available to you and your colleagues. The Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky was founded in 2001, and the Foundation's mission is to address the unmet health needs of Kentuckians. Earlier this year in June, I had the opportunity to do an event in Whitesburg, and that is a photo I took in Pine Mountain in Whitesburg, Kentucky, Letcher County. If you do, folks who are using their chat on their computer, why don't you chat in what county you're in right now so we can see where folks are from across the state if you're using the chat function. Also the chat function, you can send us questions. I already see some coming through. Um, so you can chat questions or comments via the chat on your computer. Uh, the Foundation's mission to address the unmet health needs of Kentuckians and the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky does that by developing and influencing policy improving access to care, reducing health risks and disparities, and promoting health equity. And this sign you see, which says this is a tobacco-free campus, is a sign here on our foundation offices in Louisville, Kentucky, as we have a tobacco-free campus policy here in Louisville. A few upcoming events on our Health for a Change schedule. October 1st, I'll be in Richmond, Kentucky, um, upon the invitation of the health department there on infographics and social change workshop. We'll be in person, so if you're nearby, please join us at the Madison Public Library there in Richmond. The registration is open. Uh, December 3rd, we'll have a webinar on e teens and e-cigarettes. December 4th, we have an infographics for social change. Again, another of those in-person workshops here in Louisville, Kentucky by Adobe Creative Fellow Jessica Bellamy, so I'm thrilled she'll present that to us. Foundation's website, healthy-ky.org. There you can find all the Health for a Change events on the events tab. Also learn more about our organization, find out about our current strategic plan and focus areas, see our news releases, and also on that website you can sign up for our newsletters. Your email address. Just a few more announcements before we get to the real piece of the show here this, this afternoon. Uh, the Foundation hosts an annual Health Policy Forum, and that will be held next Monday, September 23rd in Lexington. And the title of that is Medical Marijuana, Fact and Fiction. That event is on a waiting list, but there's a chance uh, that folks can attend, so you can check out that registration on the Foundation's website for the BOST Health Policy Forum. Next up, one of our partner organizations, Bounce in Louisville, is having an intro to ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences and Trauma-Informed Practices, and they have an upcoming training. So I just wanted to share that with you if you or your colleagues are interested in, attain in attending a training on trauma-informed practices. Final announcement before we get started. Uh, November 15th in Northern Kentucky and Erlanger, the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky and another health foundation serving the greater Cincinnati area, Interact for Health, we jointly co-sponsor a day-long conference on data, and that is going to be a fun event. That registration will open very soon, and I would love to see you in person in Erlanger in November. Finally, I'm thrilled to have an expert on all of these topics in the title, social media, interviews, websites, messaging, communications, just what I'm trying to do here this morning, this afternoon, uh, John Blim. John, welcome. 
Thank you, Rochelle. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon. On this late summer afternoon, I see by the list we have people dialed in from all across the Commonwealth, and that's very exciting. So it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you today, and thank you for this opportunity. So before I get started, I'd like to tell some jokes. It's almost Halloween, and if you remember anything from this webinar, maybe you'll remember these jokes, and you can share them with your family, friends, and your kids. Here we go. Why didn't the skeleton cross the road? That why didn't the skeleton cross the road? He didn't have the guts. Wait for you on that one. Why did the Cyclops give up teaching? Why did the Cyclops give up teaching? I'm sure you know the answer. He only had one pupil. Finally, this is the last one, I promise. What did King Kong say when his sister had a baby? Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Okay, I share jokes with you just for one purpose alone. When I go out and speak to people, I take them to use them as a barometer to see if people are with me or against me. And with this group today, I am not sure. So with that in mind, let's get started and put all that behind us. So today on this webinar, here's what we'll do. We'll share, and I'll share some things, hopefully some ideas that you can use today I'll encourage you, you'll encourage me by these idea sharings, and maybe you'll feel better about some of the things you're doing or can't walk away with ideas you can use that will encourage your staff and your constituents. And then I hope to answer any questions that you have as we get through this. So welcome. So here's what we know. This is pretty much universal. No one, no one, if you work in private sector, public sector, I don't care where you work, you don't have a big enough budget. We can all agree on that probably. We never have enough people. We could always use more and always bargaining with someone to get more people. We don't always have the latest resources, we don't have the best resources, or we need more resources to keep up to speed. Finally, the enemy to all of us probably Though there's 24 hours in everyone's day, we don't have enough time. So we know that that's all possible. But what I like to say, let's make the most of what you have. Let's make the most of your time, the budget you have, the people you have, and the resources. So here's also what we know. This is the uh, good part of the presentation. All these things are free. So when we talk about social media, and we talk about Facebook, we talk about Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat, even LinkedIn. Those are all free. But what we'll get into later is that to get on TV, to appear on radio shows, even to get some local press coverage or online presence, that is also free, and we'll work through that. And then I'm going to talk later about WordPress, which is an online website software that you can get for free that's very powerful, and anyone can do it. So today, here's my thought. It's not what you have, but how you use it. That's a great quote, isn't it? Well, that's a quote from me. And it's a quote I've used over the years with people I've worked for, people who've worked for me, people I've managed. Um, when I worked in local television, and I was a creative director for many years at a CBS and later at an ABC television station, we, for instance, had severe flooding coverage, and we created an extra live truck to do live reports from just some spare parts we had in the basement. So it's not what you have, but how you use it. It doesn't matter what it looks like as long as you can make it work, and it works. So think about creative ways you can do better with what you already have. And here's my menu for today, and I've kind of, since it's around the lunch hour, I've made it a food-based menu. We're going to talk about eye candy. We're going to have a main course, and we're going to talk about dessert. Here's how you can get a hold of me, and this will be at the end of the presentation as well, but I'm John Blim. I work at the WHAS Crusade for Children. We serve special needs children all across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. There's my phone number, and I'm also on Twitter at John H. Blim. Believe it or not, there was just another John Blim who took it before I did. So John H. Blim on Twitter. There you go. So in this webinar today, here is your guide to this webinar that will make it easy. Anytime you see this red arrow, Pay attention. Anytime you see anything in red, that will be helpful also. And I'll circle things to make it easier for you to see. 
So first, let's talk about eye candy. I worked with a television consultant many years ago, and this is his quote. When viewers see aerial video on TV, they'll stop and watch that channel. So imagine, if you will, you're at home and you're watching the local news at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and you're surfing through the channels. One of them has aerial video, aerial footage on the air. Generally speaking, people will stop and watch that channel over the other channels. Eric Braun was his name, still is his name, a TV consultant for many years, and he called this eye candy. In other words, something that attracts your eyes and gets you to stop. So, for instance, why do people slow down at accident scenes? We see these every day if we drive the interstates across country or even to and from work on local highways and streets. Why do we slow down? It's called rubbernecking. Some places they call them gapers blocks. Why do we slow down? Because it's not normal. We are a curious sort. It's compelling to us, and it's our nature. So again, we stop and watch because it's eye candy. So let's transition that to phones, cell phones, handheld devices. What do people stop at when they look at their feeds? If you pay attention and watch somebody you know, maybe look over their shoulder if you can, look and stop, look and see what they stop on in their Facebook feed, their Instagram account, or Twitter. Generally what they stop at, video. Video. Now, we're not going to play videos in this presentation, but you'll get the idea. This is, for instance, a cat video that obviously is popular, 100,000 views of this video, but people will watch video more than they'll watch a lot of things. So companies and organizations have gotten wise to this, and you've picked on it, on it too. Here's a, a screenshot from World News Tonight where a little capsule of news is presented on Instagram. Sponsors have also gotten client, or advertisers that have also gotten smart to this. Here's a Best Buy. You'll see that it's a sponsored ad, and they realize that people are stopping on video and they're putting what you might consider their commercial that used to be on TV is now on Instagram or on Facebook. So what can you do? Go through some ideas. What to post? I call it sticky content, and that's content that people will stop at. It's appealing, it has content, it is interesting, it's fresh, bullet point number two. I have some bullet points here, and I'm sorry for the extra bullet points. I'm not a bullet point guy, but I didn't know how else to get these messages to you, so you'll see these in the slide deck. Number three, it's visually interesting, much like we just saw a few minutes ago. And I want you to be your own customer, your client, and your stakeholder. In your organization, you know who these people are. What would they want to see? From the old movie that Kevin Costner was in, he said, build it and they will come. It was called Feel the Dreams. It's kind of true. If you build something and it's worthwhile, people will come to it. And I want you to remember this, W-I-I-F-M. Ask yourself, standing for, what's in it for me? The WIFM, what's in it for me? So let's step through some of these ideas. Here's an idea. Let's say you really like this phrase and you want to use it in a campaign or in a visual. Make a difference. You also have this great photo of this girl, and this girl's name is River. We have a photo release on her. She is one of the stu uh, ch children that we support through a grant from the WHS Crusade for Children. Her name is River. So you want to combine that with the phrase, make a difference. So it looks like that. But we want to take it one step further, and we want it to say, make a difference in the life of a child. Well, that's very compelling. You can see her eyes, her face, her smile. It's human emotion. You make eye contact, you smile, you look back at her and see good things. So here's an idea and a tip for you. So get photo releases on all the pictures you take. If you can, Find a professional photographer to donate his or her time and take your photos. I have a good friend. His name is Nick Benura. He's here in Louisville. He, every year, comes and shoots pictures of our representative children that we use throughout the year, like you just like throughout the year, like you just saw with River. And believe it or not, while everyone thinks they're a photographer, there is a big difference. This is the professional photographer, Nick, and this is one that I took. That's me and my wife enjoying ice cream on a nice summer afternoon. 
Now, it's not nearly as good as Nick's photo like that, where you look at her eyes, the gleam in her eyes, the smile. But I will say there might be some candy in this, but it's not necessarily eye candy, but you get the idea. Your photos versus a professional's. So, in essence, eye candy, when we talk about that, it's human emotion. Human emotion, face-to-face, -face, what you look at when you look in someone's eyes. And again, I'll show you this picture one more time. But there we are. There's nothing more powerful than that than human emotion. When I first joined our organization, the Crusade for Children, we had a lot of pictures of equipment, uh, incubators, isolettes, radiation or uh, x-ray machines. When I joined, we started taking pictures of the children who used this equipment, who lives were changed because they used this equipment. And it's a far more interesting idea and far more compelling. So compare this photo to what we just saw of River to this picture. That's a really nice bridge, but it does nothing for me. And you can tell the difference between her picture, human emotion, and just a picture of a bridge that does nothing. So let's go on. So when people look at their phones, they'll stop at something that's most compelling. Now this is a picture coming up that I took, and it's a nice picture, blue sky, lots of greens, a nice old house, and it looks nice. Some might say, I think it's okay. Here's a closer in shot, a tighter shot of what's in that area. Now we're getting better. You can see the background is out of focus. You can see that there's a pink flower in the center. And then we'll take it one step further. And now it gets very interesting because the background has dropped out of focus. Our focus now is, out. oh gosh, there's a bumblebee on that flower. Who saw that? We didn't see that at first. But that makes a far more interesting photo than something like this, which is a great bridge and great if you're an engineer and want to look at the structure, I suppose, but nothing very appealing to the human eye. Now, I'm as guilty as the next person, and I took this photo that you're seeing now. That's my wife and daughter. <clears throat> and I didn't do a very good job because they're overwhelmed by the flowers, overwhelmed by the bridge supports. They're overwhelmed by some buildings in the background. Now I'm going to pick on my other family members because it's fun to do that. This is a picture my brother sent of his family on a beach somewhere. Now, good luck if you can even make out any faces. I know who these people are only because of the outlines of their bodies, but it's a horrible picture. He's not listening, I hope. This is a picture as well my sister sent me of her husband looking at some art display. Now the art, that's up to you and your judgment if you think that's art or not, but I can barely see my brother-in-law, Tony. He's back there somewhere. But this is a little better. This is my daughter on her first day of school at college with her pals. And you can tell it's fun. You're looking at their eyes. They're smiling. They're having a good time. You're probably smiling to yourself. That makes for a better picture because here's breaking news to you. So many people take bad photos. Well, that's a shock, but it's so true. This is what makes human emotion. This is the eye candy. This is what makes things so much better. And okay, we'll go with this just because I like ice cream. So let's move on. So eye candy, once again, all we're talking about is human emotion. So I want to walk you through now some tips you can use to take better photos and videos. And with the advancement of cell phones, video on cell phones and pictures are so much better than they ever were before. So if you're going to do this, here's what you want to do. Hold your cell phone horizontally, get close to your subject, and don't zoom in. Zooming in on a cell phone, if you try it, you know what I mean. It gets very pixelated or jagged on the edges. Be in good light. There's something called photographer's light, and that's late in the afternoon outside, just before twilight, just before sunset. And same thing early in the morning. When I work with my friend Nick, the professional photographer, he schedules photo shoots outside in the early morning because it's the, most, the best light for people. The color temperature is just right. And when you take your pictures, take many, many photos. Don't just take one because, as we know, people blink. People close, you know, do other things. They turn their heads. They move their hands. So take multiple photos. And when you take your pictures, don't be timid. Don't stand in the back of the room. In fact, we'll talk in a little bit about why don't you stage some photos. Let's say you're at a presentation and a 
plaque is being presented or something is being presented at the front of the room. Gather the dignitaries, gather those who are giving the plaque and those who are receiving the plaque, put them side by side and say, you know what, let's take a photo and have them bunched together like they like each other and they'll laugh at that and you take a picture and it's a much better picture than being in the back of the room shooting over people's heads. So think about that when you take photos and video and the same applies to video, don't zoom in, it'll get shaky, don't uh, be far away, just get close to what you want to show in the video. Okay, we're going to move on to what I'm going to call today the main course of our webinar. We're going to talk about logos first. You'll recognize these logos. Coca-Cola has been around for more than a century. Nike was rather revolutionary when they just chose a shape, the swoosh, which I understand only cost them less than $100 when someone actually drew that back a few years, decades ago. And more recently, you're probably more familiar, too, with the Apple logo, the bite out of the Apple, which everyone knows what that is. And probably within the last 10 years, certainly, Amazon. And you'll notice in Amazon's marketing and anything they do, whether it's uh, Prime, your video service, or the trucks that drive down the street, or whatever it might be, they're using that smile under the logo much more, and that's become their icon, more iconic logo. And their branding is getting so much better, you know exactly where you what it is when you see it with that little smile, that yellow gold smiley face underneath. So let's talk about your logo and if, how yours looks. And again, here are some bullet points for you to follow along with. So I want you to be ruthless, ruthlessly consistent. It should be the same no matter what on everything. Make it prominent. And don't just change colors because it's a Tuesday and you're feeling blue or it's a Thursday and you're feeling it should be red. No, nope, keep it the same and use it all the time. And build this as your branding elements that you'll use throughout anything you do. We're a small staff of seven people on our, uh, at our, the charity I work for, so it's pretty easy for us to all collaborate and make sure we're all doing the same things. But if anybody goes rogue, we can catch them on that and put them back into the branding the logo, the style book, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. But you should do that. Make sure everybody's on the same page. And here on this slide, I show you that even I've attempted in this webinar to use my little JB initials in the lower right corner, and that syncs up with my website, johnblim.com, where I have the yellow and white JB on a blue field. So I just wanted to show you it's pretty simple to be consistent no matter what. And our host today, Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky, does a wonderful job with a really easy to read logo with nice coloring, nice representation of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the outline there. And then as we look at their website and you see in the upper left corner, they have a very nice use of that logo there. And throughout the website, they use the same color palette to make it all look the same. And that's just fantastic. And that's more what everyone should do. So, likewise, with your mission statement, same thing. Be ruthlessly consistent. It should be on everything you do. Make it prominent throughout. Use the same fonts when you do it. And again, create a style guide for your other members of your staff, your volunteer corps, whoever does work for you can follow that style guide. It's really important that these things stay in Generally, your mission statement is maybe something that came out of strategic planning and something that you use day after day, year after year to keep you on mission. And plus, it just keeps you as a reminder, this is what we do and this is why we do what we do. So I share with you the mission statement for my organization. Pretty straightforward, but it was developed a few years ago from a strategic planning session with board members, stakeholders, staff, and volunteers. So our mission the WHAS Crusade for Children makes life better for children with special needs by inspiring generosity with our community partners. And I like this mission statement a lot because it, when I give presentations out in the field, I'll put this slide up with our mission statement, and then the next statement will say like, and no better partner do we have than XYZ. 
than Norton Healthcare, than Jefferson County Public Schools, than Baptist Health, or the Kentucky Employees Charitable Campaign. Whatever campaign I'm on, I put up our mission statement, talk about our community partners, and then put the next slide of our community partner. And it works out really, really well. So keep that in mind that you should just reinforce that. It helps people understand what you do, for sure. And a note about consistency. So we've talked about colors, we've talked about your logo, we've talked about your mission, we've talked about your branding. Here's a quote I like. Just when you're getting tired of it, people are just getting familiar with it. That's a quote from me. When I worked in local television, I was the creative director, as I mentioned, at a CBS affiliate and ABC affiliate, and also started my career as a news photographer out in the field. But we'd often get tired of the same old promotional announcement on the air that we created a month ago and said, oh, why are we still running that? Why are we still running that weather promo? And you've probably seen some on your local station. Just when we were getting tired of it, people were just getting familiar with it. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. Don't work too fast to get things out of the way. People need to get familiar with what you're trying to do. So this idea of consistency is building blocks. And the blocks I'm giving you here are not just for what you do for your job, but this is part of your everyday. It makes your life less stressful. If you have to put out a press release, if you have to create a graphic for Instagram, all the building blocks should be there that you can just cut and paste, piecemeal things together, and quickly develop something that looks really good, it's consistent, it's ruthlessly consistent, it's in your mission, part of your brand, part of your style, it's who you are, and people will know that and not mistake, mistake you for anything else. So that's why we do it, for building blocks for you, for your organization, and frankly for your life if you think about it. So now I want to move on to the dessert part of the presentation. Everybody take a minute, grab a glass of water, and get ready for dessert. Here we go. So prior to this presentation, um, Rochelle Siegert sent me some of the questions that you all had in the spreadsheet when you registered for this prior to the webinar. And some of you said, share a success story. So I want to share a few of those and even some failures, if you will, that will help you maybe as examples to how to do things better. So you maybe all recall in, in 2016, Muhammad Ali died at the age of 74. It was a worldwide event. His funeral was held here in Louisville. The funeral procession was held here in Louisville, and worldwide media converged on Louisville and made it uh, quite a special time, and the city and the life of Muhammad Ali became just front and center. So I took the afternoon off of his funeral cortege, the funeral procession down Bartstown Road with my family because we thought it was a special enough event. Let's go watch and see what happens, and we met some really nice people. And I lined up in a part of the procession early on. So it traveled for miles throughout the city, and I took a picture probably within the first mile of that. And it's very simple. It was Will Smith, you see here, along Bardstown Road, waves to fans chanting, Ali, Ali, Ali. That picture I took, I was very lucky to get it. I didn't realize it was Will Smith until I looked at it again, and there he was. And when I posted it on Twitter, and this is my Twitter account, I used hashtags. And if you don't know what a hashtag is, a hashtag is basically like a big fish tank. If you put a hashtag like these inspired by Ali, hashtag Ali Funeral, hashtag Louisville, anyone else who tweets in this case and uses inspired by Ali, all those tweets will go in that, on that page or that part of Twitter. So if you search inspired by Ali, you'll see this tweet and anyone else's tweet who was used, who used that hashtag. Well, I did that. And uh, as people often say, it never happened to me before, but my phone would be what you call blew up. As I put my phone in, a pocket, in my pocket, it just kept beeping and chiming. And so within just moments, I had 300 retweets and 365 likes. And it was all because I was early in the funeral procession, and there were others miles down the road who didn't know what had happened yet or were expecting it. And they said, oh, my gosh, look, Will Smith is in this parade. This is amazing. Can't wait to see him. And it went so well that unbeknownst to me, but the next day, BuzzFeed, and if you're not familiar with BuzzFeed, it's an alternate news source. I had teenage children at the time who are now in their 20s, and I became a rock star because BuzzFeed picked up my tweet. 
suddenly I was cool because, as you can see, it was at the very bottom, liked by 340 and 260 people were still talking about this and picked up my tweet and went around the world. So that's what happens when you know something is unique, you'll see people retweet and tweet. So why was this a success? It was timely, timeliness. I was early in the funeral procession. Others were downstream, so to speak, down the way, and they saw it and said, oh, wow, look at Will Smith is in this parade, or a procession, not a parade. Very topical. Something happened that, that day, and as I mentioned, it used those hashtags so people knew where to go. Now, a word about hashtags. Be sure to research hashtags before you use them. I know someone whose initials are BS. Yes, BS. And she would often hashtag her things BS. Well, if you go to hashtag BS, you can imagine what you might see. So think about it, <laughs> research it before you use it, and go there first before you start using any old hashtag. Lesson learned. Here's another success story. So each and every year, the WHS Crusade for Children, who I work for, has an annual telethon, kind of old-fashioned. It's been around for 66 years. And we do a variety show from the Kentucky Center for the Arts. And we have performers and dancers and singers and whatnot. Well, here's a still frame of the Latkowski sisters on the 2013 WHS Crusade for Children. And please note at the bottom of this page on YouTube, more than 4.1 million views of this video have occurred. It was a very cute video, very touching. Two sisters who looked at each other through a mirror, one in a wheelchair, one not, and they did a dance. So why was that successful? Because it was touching, it was human emotion, it was people, it was a feature story, it was people doing the right thing, and people really love stories. They love feel-good stories. So the Lakofsky sisters, you can find this. If you go to YouTube and sh search for that video, you'll see it, and you can see for yourself. Another success story I want to share with you. So prior to being with the Crusade for Children, I was the Creative Services Director at WHS 11, WHS TV in Louisville. In about 2002, I was the executive producer of the Thunder Over Louisville coverage on WHAS 11. And from those, for those of you outside Louisville who don't know, Thunder Over Louisville is the largest fireworks display generally, annually, a few weeks before the Kentucky Derby to kick off the Kentucky Derby Festival. Hundreds of thousands of people line the Ohio River. And for decades, WHS TV had done live coverage of this event, like 14 hours all day from 6 a.m. to 11, to midnight, maybe 10 p.m., depends. And so one of the ideas I had in my mind was how can we get to this to a broader audience? How can we do something more than just make it Louisville? Because I thought it was a great untold story. And a friend of mine, a co-worker, he and I worked on it together. We were big into shortwave radio. For those of you who don't know what shortwave radio is, it's worldwide radio that can be heard on signals all across. You often hear about the BBC or Voice of America across the world. Well, would Thunder work on shortwave radio? Well, not so much, but it led us to this idea to get it on American Forces Network. And how this worked was very simple. I have a coworker who knew someone, a colonel in the Kentucky Air National Guard, who introduced us to the program director in California for the Armed Forces Network. So now 17 years later to this day, every year on the 4th of July, an hour's worth of Thunder Over Louisville airs on Armed Forces Network and is seen in 180 countries at military installations all around the world by servicemen and women and employees of the Department of Defense. So not only do I think that's pretty cool, but again, it's an idea. We just batted around, asked some questions. So my next question to you is, do you know anyone? Do you know anyone who could help you with something like that? Someone you go to church with, someone your kid goes to school with, some coworker, someone you go to the gym with, who knows somebody who knows somebody that they can help you spread your message to wherever that is happening to be. So think about that. It was just a really fun success story. So again, I'm going to start with here's what we know because here's some facts that will come up next. I wanted to point out the most popular social media websites. 
And it may surprise you to see that YouTube is number one. Facebook is two. Instagram, distant third, and then it goes down from there. Pinterest, surprisingly, is ahead of LinkedIn, which many people have told me LinkedIn is kind of like Facebook with people wearing dress clothes. I'm on LinkedIn. I love it, but it's not nearly as popular, but it's more popular than Twitter, which may surprise many. But Twitter is often the home of politics and sports, and if you don't like either one of those, you may not be there. Only used by 25%. And this is all U.S. adults, by the way, as of late 2018. And what's app? You may not be familiar with that. That's a texting app that you can use pretty much worldwide without charge. And it's a very easy, friendly app to use. So YouTube 1, Facebook 2. Again, many surprises. But this may not be a surprise to many. YouTube has crossed 2 billion viewers a month. Think about that, 2 billion viewers a month. That's a lot of viewers. So if you have a video, start thinking. If you don't, you need to get some, and you need to carve out a YouTube channel. So let's move closer to home, and let's talk about your neighborhood. Let's talk about your county. Let's talk about your town. Let's talk about your nearest media outlet. So on local media, let's get on local media. Let's take your message and see if we can get that out there. Here in Louisville, there are more than 70 hours of local TV morning shows in the Louisville market. Each station, and there's four stations doing this, does two to three hours of morning news. Some do four. They'll do like an hour program from 9 to 10, 10 to 11, morning talk infotainment, information and entertainment infotainment show, and they do a new news. So there's a lot of opportunity, and they need content. On top of that, there's hundreds of hours of local radio shows. Now, many s local stations have gone to voice tracking or pre-recorded in the midday, and that's anywhere from after 9 o'clock till about 3 o'clock. But in the morning drive, 6 to 9, 6 to 10, and in the afternoon drive, 3 to 6 or 3 to 7, that's generally a live program with somebody in a studio. So you could get on those shows, morning TV, morning or afternoon radio. And then don't ever forget your local newspaper, your magazines, local magazines, like the ones you might see at Kroger. Generally, a lot of communities have those, those advertising magazines. Some are, you know, advertiser content-based, but usually they're always looking for a nice nugget to put in there. For instance, here's the local station, WHS 11. We're just down the hall. Our office is in the WHS TV building. They're on there every morning from 4.30 to 7 o'clock, and they need content. So I'm showing you the slide again, 70 hours of local TV in Louisville alone, hundreds of hours of local radio, and don't forget your local newspaper. Influencers, and when I mean influencers, those are online people with lots of following on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and they've kind of made a, uh, either a side career or a, or a full career just being an influencer to people on those platforms. So here's some tips. Local morning shows, they need content. Many of these companies that run the TV stations are publicly traded companies now, and they're always being asked to do more with a lot less. So the staffs that used to be there a decade or two ago are not necessarily there. So they need content because they need things that are pretty easy to do, and you can help them with that. Get to know the assignment editor. The assignment editor is the person who keeps a file in the newsroom by the date. Let's say you're having a... Uh, silent auction, you're having a fundraiser, you're having a cookout, you're having a big event, shuttle your press release to the assignment editor and that'll get it in the file. Get to know a reporter, and again, talk about relationships. How can you get to know a reporter on the local beat? You can do that very easily now through social media. They all have accounts. You can call them up, you can email them, you can talk to them on the phone. Just work smarter at this. Get to know people at these local outlets so you can become their friends, become their go-to person. You probably watch a lot of these programs. You notice, boy, that person is on there all the time. That guy mixing those drinks, he's on there all the time. That person who carves pumpkins, on there all the time. How can I do that? So be memorable. I want you to write handwritten thank you notes, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But nobody does this anymore. Nobody writes handwritten notes. Everybody does emails and or text people. Write notes, send them in the mail, spend 50 cents. We'll talk about that in a minute. So the good news here too is this develops content for you. 
if you do an interview on one of these local TV shows, they will make a video and they will post it generally on their website. And then once it's on their website, it's a ready-made piece for you. You go on there, you cut and paste the link, you can put it on YouTube for yourself, you can put it on your website, you can share it on your social media sites, and it's just a magical thing because all you did was show up and do your job, and they helped you by producing this nice high-definition video of you doing your thing. And now about handwritten thank you notes. I send a lot of these. I wear out my ink. I wear out my right hand. I wear out um, notes because I have our printer print a lot of these. No one sends them anymore, and every time I do, I get a reaction. I'll get a thank you for the note. I'll get an email in reply, you didn't have to do that. And when I do send them, I put my business card inside that has my mission statement, has my email, has my phone number, and generally I always get a reply. So go old school and write yourself some thank you notes. Go buy a bundle, get some made by your printer, and just have fun with it because it can be lots and lots of fun. And make it very specific why you thank them. Thank you for doing this extra effort. People love these things. So when you go on these programs, whether it's radio, TV, or you're going to do a newspaper piece, whatever it might be, get there early. Bring food. Let's say you're doing a big food event. Bring food, whatever it is you're cooking out, hot dogs, hamburgers. Bring T-shirts for the event. Bring one for the anchor person. Hold it up on camera. Bring a special guest. You have a sponsor. You have a cook. You have a chef. You have somebody who's going to do whatever they're going to do, a musician. Bring them to the show because generally these shows will have a little side set that you'll sit at, and there's plenty of room to do different things, whether it be displaying food, T-shirts, uh, playing the guitar, whatever it might be. So bring something to show. And then always have your talking point including a call to action, a call to action that um, provides a phone number, a web page, Facebook page, or whatever it might be, and so that you can put that up on the screen in a full screen. They call this full screen graphics on TV. So at the end of your session, it'll be there for people to write down and have a call to action. And then for you to be prepared ahead of time, and this is the, the most important part of this, I call it journalism 101, 101, 101. Prepare to answer these questions, very basic. Who, what, why, where, when, and how? So who will be at the event? What will it be? Why are we doing it? Where will it be? When will it be? And how are you doing it? So anticipate answering those questions in your own mind. And don't forget your mission statement. Don't forget your website. Don't forget your social media handles. And then rehearse and rehearse again so you're ready for any possibility because you don't know exactly if these interviews will go off on a tangent, be what you expect them to be, but generally, just be ready for anything. And again, these are building blocks. So let's pause and think about that for a second. That's what we're doing here. We've created from way back, we've got our logo, we've got our mission statement, we've got our T-shirts, we've got our food, we've got our gift basket, we've got our silent auction item, whatever it is, we're bringing these things along so we have a tangible piece to show a reporter, to show a host, a radio host, a picture in the newspaper of the T-shirt you're wearing. And we'll talk more about this. But these are all building blocks, not just for you, but your life, but for everything, because this takes the stress off you again. If I'm prepared, this will all come easily, because you never know how quickly there will be a need for you to be on one of these programs, because they may have a hole. And again, anything you could do to make their job easier, they'll appreciate, they'll use, and off you go. And this is also vitally important. These things will help you in a time of crisis. So I want to talk a minute about this for a second. So you'll be prepared. You'll have your mission statement, your elevator speech. You control the message. Issue a, issue a press release. And I'm going to talk more about this, but don't put your leadership on camera and you rehearse it. Okay, so we had a board member who committed some crimes. He served federal prison time of more than four years. As you know, the justice system works long and slow and drawn out. So it was constantly in the news for a number of months. Our organization is housed in the TV station, WHAS-TV. So it was right down the hall when they needed a soundbite, and this was pretty serious stuff. So 
What's the first thing we did? We didn't put our CEO and president on camera. Here's why. As I mentioned, these are publicly traded companies now that have been asked to do more with less. Video sits on a server, and whenever the story were to recycle again, when the next hearing came up or preparation hearing or court date or indictment or whatever the case may be in the justice system, that video of your CEO, our CEO, would show up again and again and again. And you don't want that because it's not the best light on your organization. Instead, we released a statement. We released a, uh, a press release that reiterated that our organization's mission statement, that people believe in us, that people gave us credit for, and that we've been around for 60 plus years. So I hope this never happens to you, but should it, you just need to be prepared and I would highly recommend that you take this direction because again, the wallpaper video, we're calling that because it just keeps showing up like wallpaper, is used over and over and over again. But you can also use it in time of success. And now I wanna talk a little bit about controlling your own message. So recently, the Triple Crown of Running in Louisville, and for those of you who don't know, it was a series of three runs, three races, foot races, a five mile, or excuse me, a three mile, a six mile, and a 10 mile race roughly in the spring that led up to the Louisville um, Mini Marathon, the Kentucky Derby Festival Mini Marathon and Marathon. And abruptly, this last year, it was just canceled. The organizers said, we're done. With little warning, there was nothing we could do. And I always say we because the Crusade for Children was a recipient of the funds and any proceeds from those three races, so a significant contributions in the tens of thousands of dollars. Well, another company came in and bought the rights to the Triple Crown of Running within months and kept it going. And they said, you know what, we just want to send out a press release. Press release, we said, no, let's do something bigger than this. Let's control the message. Let's get some kids who get help from the WHS Crusade for Children. Let's put our logo out in front of the cameras, as you can see there. Let's have some kids come up and with our logo and the Triple Crown of Running logo, cut a ribbon and make it a memorable moment. Because again, we're talking about human emotion. I want to zoom in on this picture a little better. And you can see these are kids from uh, visually impaired preschool sy syndrome, uh, excuse me, visually impaired preschool services, Down syndrome of Louisville. These are different kids who came out and we did the big scissors, the ribbon cutting, and it's a much better image than just sending out a press release, and this is one that will last for a long time. So again, control the message and make sure that you do it and the way you want to do it, not the way somebody else wants to do it. And again, it was ready-made. You saw all the cameras there. These organizations are hungry for news that they can deliver relatively easily, and that press conference, with a ribbon cutting with children, that's, an, that's a magical emotional story that they'll gladly run. So how do you do what you do? So let's talk about that for a second. Test yourself. Be your focus group of one. Ask your coworkers how they consume their social media. What do they do? How do they do it? When do they do it? Ask your friends. And then ask the age group you're trying to attract. Test yourself and your friends. I want to talk a little bit about just some, you may have some assumptions about internet access, some assumptions about websites, so let's talk about that for just a minute. So here's a rather startling statistic, at least it was for me. 72.6% of internet users will access the web solely via their smartphones by 2025. Now I know in some parts of the state uh, cell phone coverage is not the best, but by 2025, which is five to six years from now, and you can see this is from uh, research done in 20, 2019, 72% of all Internet users will access the web only by their smartphone. And if you are out and about, you'll see more and more people do that and don't do much from the PC, from the laptop, from the tablet. So I want to show you also the difference between a traditional site and a mobile site and if you're not using a platform that gives you a ready-made mobile site, you should think about it. So for instance, this is our website for the WHS Crusade for Children. And this is our mobile site. Now I'm gonna talk in a little bit about a platform called WordPress, but WordPress automatically 
makes your website work on any platform, whether it's a tablet, desktop, laptop, and most importantly, a mobile phone. You can tell, you can see they look a lot alike. Here again is the traditional site mobile site. It just compresses the aspect ratio to make it different. So when you have a mobile friendly site that you've already automatically allows you to make it mobile friendly, it looks like you. So it creates that element of trust. It's secure and that's where you can also get many, many more of your donations. If you do donations, if you're a nonprofit that takes donations, you can monetize it to make a bigger impact because more and more people are using their cell phones to gather that information and to make donations. So what should you post online? Create sticky content, and sticky content is something that's interesting, worth sticking around for, pardon the pun. It's fresh content, it's visually interesting. And again, be your own customer, be your own client, be your stakeholder, and as I mentioned before, build it and they will come. talk for a second about search engine optimization on your website. I'm going to talk in a minute about Google Trends, but let's say you're selling socks, you're selling bacon, you're selling shoes, use those keywords in your posts. Use keywords and phrases on your site. Use tools like trends.google.com because as of earlier this year, 70 per 76, and you probably know that number's climbing, 70%, 76% of all searches come from Google. So know your customer and think about the keywords you would use. So here's trends.google.com. It's a fun tool if you have time to just get on there and check things out. You can see how key phrases, words, different things trend versus other words that might be more advantageous to you. So let's talk a little bit too about when to post. It depends on the platform. So do your research, and I'll go through a few of those in a minute and work smarter. Don't just take a shot in the dark. Be more strategic. So Hootsuite, this is from Hootsuite. Hootsuite is a platform where you can populate all your social media sites with one posting, and this is their research. For Instagram, the best time is noon to one, Monday through Friday. Okay, what happens noon to one Eastern time? Well, for many people, that's lunch, and that's probably when they access their phones for the first time if they're very busy in the morning. So think about that, Instagram, noon to 1, Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. For Facebook, again, research from Hootsuite. This shows you that 12 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, is their best time. And then you'll see this says B2C. B2C is business to consumer. And I'm going to step through. I have a little closer shot of this graph. But you can see this is over four quarters, including the first quarter of this year. And the best time is noon. So again, we're back at that lunch hour. Also from Hootsuite, I found this uh, post, this paragraph that I like so much. Know your audience, how to find the best time to post. How old are they? Where do they live? What are their commute, what's their commute like? What do they do for work? What are their challenges and pain points? What social networks do they use? Do they scroll through their feeds on their phones or a computer? So research, here's your to-do list as we begin to wrap this up. Research when to post, what time, do the, what time do you use social media, choose the best times on each platform, review your presence on those platforms, and then install Google Analytics on your website, and we'll touch on that now. There's a great video I found that I'd like you to go search for. It's called uh, WP Beginner is the user, so search WP Beginner on YouTube, and there's an eight-minute video that talks to you about how to install Google Analytics on your website. This will all be later, and you can look at these again. Google Analytics tutorial. There was a nice video I found that was only nine minutes long by this guy. His name is Julian. And if you go to YouTube, just search Measure School, one word, on YouTube, and you'll find his videos. And once you have Google Analytics, you get a snapshot like this emailed right to your inbox that shows you how you're doing with users, sessions, bounce rate, and things of that nature. This happens to be the one for my organization. 
So as we close out, I just want to hit up about a couple of things about WordPress. If you don't know about it, you've seen this image of my website for the WHS Crusade for Children before. But here's the traditional site, and here's the mobile. And it just makes everything look the same. And if you don't know about WordPress, it is free. And if you know a developer, they can walk you through it. I've developed five websites myself using WordPress, and if I can do it, wow, you can do it for sure. So that's my presentation. We've talked about eye candy. We've had a main course. We've talked about your logo, your branding, your style guide. We've talked about social media and what best to do, what not to do. Times of crisis, times of goodness. You control the message. Get on these many, many local programs because they need content. And if you need me, there's my website for WHS Crusade for Children, whscrusade.org. I have my own website you're welcome to look at johnblim.com. Here's my contact information. And I thank you for your time today. We finished up. It's about 1.57, so perfect timing. And thanks, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And thank you for joining me today on this terrific summer afternoon. Thanks, John. I learned a lot. I love it that the first three quarters was, you know, talking about success stories, because that's the Great, a great frame for what we do. Um, a lot of folks today are here from local health departments and other health serving organizations, so a lot of time we're talking about uh, things that are problematic, health problems in our communities. Uh, a great comment on your thank you note idea. Someone said that journalist Koki Roberts, who we know died this week, also sent handwritten thank you notes to some of her folks. So I uh, appreciate all the um, the basics so we can get back to think about what we're doing and being on message. Um, John, I really loved your idea of what's in it for me. And when I thought about that, I, I really said, what's in it for the mission? I'm proud to work here at the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky, and I love to think about communications and how it relates to our mission. And all of us on the call have missions and organizations that we're working toward. In our final two minutes, I want to remind everyone that this afternoon you'll receive an email from me and it will have a link to an online post-event survey. That survey, you can give feedback on the webinar today, share your ideas for future webinar topics, and it just takes about three minutes. And that's a photo of my little dog there taking a nap. Um, and this webinar today on social media and communication basics was your idea. It came from you all. This is what you wanted to hear. So I'm thrilled that John Blim was able to share his experiences with us today on this webinar. Uh, do take the survey. I would love to hear your thoughts, and that helps us craft future Health for a Change events um, to be serving the Commonwealth of Kentucky folks just like yourself. If you're not already on the Foundation's email list, you can do that at healthy-ky.org. And since we're talking about social media, here's a lot of the social media the Foundation does, the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky Facebook page, again, our website, healthy-ky.org, and the Foundation's Twitter handle, healthyky. I tweet for the Foundation out of KY Health Facts, and you can see the website for kentuckyhealthfacts.org. Thanks, everyone, for being on the call. Here's my contact information. I'd love to see you in person at an upcoming infographics workshop, or feel free to email or call me directly. Thanks, everyone, for being on the call today. I learned a lot. Thanks, John Blim. Have a great You're afternoon. Welcome.